I'm Emre Aradri, and in this recording I will be giving you some information on the creation and historical background of the ballet Murat V. In the second half of the 19th century, among certain members of the Ottoman imperial family, as part of daily recreation, it had become customary to play the pianoforte and to present original musical compositions to each other as gifts. This tradition originated from the reforms of the progressive Sultan Mahmud II, who, in 1828, invited Giuseppe Donizetti, the eldest brother of the celebrated opera composer, to Constantinople to become the Instructor General of the Imperial Ottoman Military Bands, formed after European models. Giuseppe would eventually rise to the rank of an Ottoman general, and as Donizetti Pasha remain at the Ottoman capital for the rest of his life until his death in 1856. Apart from reforms in the military, Mahmud II also took the lead in introducing the Ottoman princes and the ladies of his harem to the rudiments of European music by ordering pianofortes from Vienna for his new palace, built complete with Greco-Roman classical columns in the European manner, on the banks of the Bosphorus in Besiktas. He also ordered concerts to be given at court, as reported by the musical world in London in 1839, at which a young Turk, who had acquired his education at Paris, played among other pieces one of Beethoven's sonatas with variations which enraptured the assembly and drew down thunders of applause. It was in this kind of environment that Mahmud's son and successor, Sultan Abdul Majid, ascended to the throne in 1839 and his own son and heir, Mehmet Murad Effendi, was born in Istanbul on the 21st of September, 1840. Soon the young prince's ears were being filled with the strains of Italian operatic potpourri, military marches, polkas and waltzes, played by his father's military bands on the palace quay, as well as with the sounds of piano music which resonated within the imperial harem. When Franz Liszt played before his father in 1847, the seven-year-old Mehmet Murad Effendi was also most likely among the harem ladies who admired the Hungarian celebrity's virtuoso performance. Sultan Abdul Majid took a personal interest in the education of his son. An Erhard pianoforte was specially ordered for him from Paris, and the young prince started having piano lessons with Donizetti's successor, Caliuste Guatelli, who was originally from Parma in Italy, and like Donizetti, was also created a pasha. As well as playing the piano, the young prince also showed an early talent for composing short salon pieces in the fashionable European dance forms of the period, such as waltzes, quadrilles, polkas and gallops. Further to this activity, his father also took him to opera performances. Records show that when Sultan Abdul Majid honoured with his presence, the Italian opera house run by the Naum brothers in Pera on the 26th of March 1851, the 11-year-old Prince Murad and his two brothers, Princes Abdul Hamid and Mehmet Reshad, also accompanied their father. And on that occasion, the local French newspaper, Journal de Constantinople reported that the Sultan was seen giving information to his sons about the performance, which included the first and third acts of Meyerbeer's Robert le Diable and the final act of Bellini's Sonnambula. Yet, within a quarter of a century, Murad would find himself suddenly catapulted to the Ottoman throne following the death of his father in 1861 and the subsequent deposition of his uncle, Sultan Abdulaziz, in 1876. Thus, the piano player, French-speaking, cultivated and refined prince, was proclaimed the 33rd Sultan of the Ottoman Empire as Murad V. His reign, however, proved to be the shortest in Ottoman history, and after a mere three months on the throne, Murad was deposed on the grounds of insanity and was kept under strict house arrest with his family and entourage in the palace of Turan on the banks of the Bosphorus for the remaining 28 years of his life, until his death in 1904. Despite this most tragic and lonely existence, the ex-sultan never gave up playing the piano and continued to compose dance music, which he dedicated 
to the members of his family. The story of the emergence of the life of Murad V as a ballet subject is directly related to some of the coincidences I have experienced personally, and its libretto, although based on historical facts, is nevertheless a mixture of reality with imagination. On the 24th of July 2010, I had presented a repertoire featuring my own string arrangements of the original compositions of Murad V at a concert to mark the 70th birthday of his fourth generation grandson, Osman Selahattin Osmanolu, in Bodrum at the home of his daughter, Aisha Osmanolu. The concert also featured a recently discovered march by Murad's daughter, Hatice Sultan, who had originally presented the composition to his father on the occasion of one of his birthdays at Turan Palace, and this historical connection had naturally made an impact on the guests on that afternoon in Bodrum. The next day, by sheer coincidence, I bumped into Adwan Davran, the then director of the Ankara State Opera and Ballet Company, who was also on holiday in Bodrum at the time, and I happened to mention to him the special concert I had just given. While talking about the idea of a joint project between us, perhaps still under the spell of the concert, I expressed my desire to create a ballet based on the life of Murad V, set to a score using his own compositions, which I had been conducting at many of my concerts over the years. This was indeed a project I had been contemplating for a very long time, knowing full well how wonderfully Murad's jovial dance music would lend itself to choreography. My enthusiasm was also shared by Davran, and at that moment the very first step towards making this dream come true was taken. This was further enhanced by the support of the then director of the general director of the state opera and ballet companies, Professor Rengam Gökman, who made sure that the project moved forward swiftly without hindrance. From the moment I started writing the libretto, I deliberately tried to avoid the subject of the work as a didactic life story. As in a classical Tchaikovsky ballet, I imagined that the story could be drawn in plain, simple lines. But behind this simplicity, meticulously well-researched historical and musical nuances be brought to life not only in the score, but also in the set designs, costumes and choreography throughout the scenes. Imprisoned in the palace on the grounds of mental illness, but quite evident from his compositions and from the memoirs related by his family, Murad's bouts of depression were in fact transitory episodes and also triggered by the mysterious death of his uncle Sultan Abdulaziz soon after his abdication. The libretto deals with the crucial moments in Murad's life in snippets and flashbacks. Through these kaleidoscopic moments, the audience is drawn to the tensions between his past and present, his regrets and hopes, in an unfolding story of bitterness and forgiveness. And Murad's mental anguish is represented throughout the ballet as struggles with an imaginary character no other than a reflection of his self. Further, his lonely and imprisoned life serves as a metaphor for the frustrations of the creative artist, who eventually finds salvation not from the outside world to which he is desperately trying to reach out, but in the serene depths of his quiet inner soul. While linking the imaginary and real elements in the ballet, I use the dream phenomenon, perhaps the most magical and nurturing source of creativity, as a strong glue that holds the pieces in place. And in doing so, I was inspired by an article entitled Gölgeler Rüyalar in Turkish, meaning Shadows Dreams, penned by one of my favourite authors, Abdulhak Shinasi Hisar, where he wrote, My dreams are never treated like me. In fact, they even make my eyes wide open. They help me to see and feel situations much better. Some of the baffling incidents I encounter in the day even find their answers in my dreams, an experience which I find most enlightening. The ballet takes place on the 21st of September 
1890, on Sultan Murad's 50th birthday, and it is a dream within a dream. The dethroned monarch is asleep in his private chamber. In his dream he sees himself with his entourage at the traditional sword-bearing ceremony in Ayub. In real life, the dethroned Murad was never able to perform this investiture ceremony, which every Ottoman sultan was expected to fulfil during his accession to the throne. In a sign of his mental unrest in these recurring dreams, Murad always sees his true self in conflict with an imaginary self that is strong and able to perform the ceremony. These dreams exposed his unbalanced nature and the personal dilemmas he suffered, which resulted in the abrupt termination of his reign. At the end of the conflict in his dream, Murad loses his fight against his powerful imaginary self and witnesses the gates of Turan Palace slowly closing on him. The start of his eternal captive life, against which he has no choice but to submit. But this is also the start of the journey of the liberation of his soul, as expressed in the closing verses of Yahya Kemal Beatle's evocative poem, evening music. The world recedes the vision dims, as in the thousand and one nights it seems, a dream begins within a dream. What makes Murat V a unique ballet is that its score is in part based on the original piano compositions of the protagonist himself, which is undoubtedly a first in the history of Turkish ballet. Originally orchestrated by myself, and subsequently reorchestrated by Bujo Hoynik in totally new arrangements, the entire ballet score was prepared with choreography in mind. The original manuscripts of Sultan Murad's compositions were discovered by chance in the 1970s when Istanbul University's Mathematical Institute acquired a second-hand grand piano. Along with the piano came a box full of scores, and upon inspection it became clear that these belonged to Sultan Murad V. I was given photocopies of these scores by the late Suha Umur, who originally studied them when the scores were sent by the university to Topkapu Museum archives for initial inspection, and subsequently they were returned to the Istanbul University Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. Umur had also prepared a small exhibition featuring some of these works in the harem section of the Dormabatra Palace in the 1990s, and much encouraged my work and research. There is no doubt that playing the pianoforte and composing music provided Murad with a means of relaxation in a life of eternal physical imprisonment. Written in his own hand on the frontispieces of these albums are remarks in French, such as an album for the pianoforte composed by Murad V after his deposition in the palace of Turan. These autographed manuscript albums further shed light on Murat's trapped life in Turan Palace, as some of the compositions, all of them numbered, contain in the legend short notes in his own hand, either in French or Ottoman, relating to daily matters, events or moods. For example, a polka numbered 697 has the caption, A day I felt exceptionally happy, 19th of August. 22nd of February, 1887, however, proved to be another happy and productive day, with Murad managing to compose three pieces, an allegro, a shortish and a polka, composed in one day. He often signed these compositions in French as Murad Senk, which was magnified to appear as a brebka on the intermission curtain. Apart from selections from Sultan Murad's original compositions, the score of the ballet also features selections integrated from the works of his contemporaries, including his daughter, Hatice Sultan, his professor of music, Gwateli Pasha, Rafat Bey, who was his chief caller of prayers, Her Excellency, the wife of Omar Pasha, Anna Simonis, Charles d'Albert, and August d'Adalburg. None of these works were chosen at random, as they all have some relevance or coherence to the Sultan's life and times. 
and they establish a musical and aesthetic uniformity to the score. The overture, for instance, is Rufat Bey's Prière, composed and published as a piano score on the occasion of Murad's accession to the throne, its cover bearing his Tura, his personal imperial cipher. Its sombre music is highly symbolic, a prophetic reference to his short reign and provides an organic and appropriate introduction to his tragic and lonely life. Guatelli's elegy for the pianoforte, composed expressly for his piano pupil Murad, is also incorporated to the score, as well as Bartolomeo Pisani's moving funeral march, Une larme sur la tombe du Sultan Abdelmejid. But the entire ballet score is held together by Istanbul-born Chevalier d'Adelbuk's romantic and lush symphony fantasy, Aubert du Bosphore, dedicated to Murat's father, Sultan Abdelmejid, and published in Vienna in the 1850s. Divided into five sections, including subsections, the musical language of the symphony fantasy has all the dramatic ingredients fit to be choreographed for dance, with movements entitled Méditation et Réverie, Chanson Turque, Grand Marche de Medjidie, and Levé de la Lune et la Chance Nocturne sous la Bosphore. Produced by Atesh Orga, I had also made the world premiere recording of this symphony with the Prague Symphony Orchestra in Rudolfinum in 2005. Sultan Abdulaziz, whose mysterious death no doubt weighed heavily on Murad, was also a composer of waltzes and dances, so much so that some of his compositions were even published in Italy by Luca of Milan. In fact, when the Sultan visited London in 1867 as the guest of Queen Victoria, Murad was also among his entourage and heard his uncle's original compositions, La Gondole Barcarolle, played by the British military bands. The European press was astonished that the Ottoman Sultan was a composer of this kind of repertoire, but all of this would be forgotten in years to come, whilst the scores gathered dust in the archives. The printed score of the Sultan's Barcarolle featured a Venetian gondola on its front cover, and this inspired me to create the first scene in Act II depicting the deposition of Abdulaziz in the state barge to the palace of Topkapı to the strains of his own La Gondole Barcarolle. It was also inspired by a painting by his son entitled Fog, by the future and last caliph of the Ottomans. Abdul Mijud Effendi, who was an accomplished painter. Ottoman ambassadors to Europe, who saw opera houses and theatres for the first time, used the term Hayal Hane, House of Imagination, to describe in rather romantic terms these places of drama and acting. Sultan Abdul Mejid had gifted in 1859 to Istanbul a small but a sumptuous jewel box of a theatre built within his Dolmabahce Palace complex, which was decorated by Charles Séchant of the Paris Opera. Sadly, this beautiful theatre was to be completely gutted in a devastating fire within eight years. The French journal L'Illustration had published an engraving of the interior of the theatre, and an artist friend, Aishit Turemish, produced a colour painting of it, which inspired me to recreate in my libretto the interior of this lost opera house in Act I. Savash Jamgurs, who prepared the set designs meticulously, also designed the sets for this theatre scene. Murad must have seen productions in the theatre accompanied by his father, in fact, according to a report published in the Journal de Constantinople, when the theatre opened on the 12th of January 1859 in the presence of the Sultan and foreign diplomats, a ballet, La Chasse de Dien, The Chase of Diana, was performed, which inspired the Apollo and the Diana scene in our production as a ballet within the ballet. When Turan Palace was built in the 19th century, it replaced an old convent of the Mevlevi dervishes, whose tombs remain buried under the foundations of the new structure. One could clearly feel a connection between their fate and Murad's tragic imprisonment in the same location years later. 
this connection further reminded me of the Sufi principle of struggle against man's internal weaknesses, which were selfishness, vanity and ambition, and the ensuing search for self-fulfillment, which enfolded itself in purification and enlightenment. The scene of the dervishes in the ballet found its perfect musical expression in the score of Adelbuch's Chanson Turc, the second movement of his symphony fantasy. The ballet Murad V was choreographed by Armand Davran and Volkan Ersoy of the Ankara State Ballet Company. The descendants of the Sultan also helped us by allowing access to their personal family archives, and my friend Dr. Ayub Sabri Charmakle presented me with an original manuscript of one of Murad's compositions as a truly incredible source of inspiration. It would be unfair to assess the musical quality of Murad's compositions out of context. The circumstances under which they were composed must be taken into account. He was not by any means a professional musician by training, and he did not write music to be original, inventive or progressive. For Murad, music served a purpose of mere recreation, an attitude that was not uncommon at the time either for the Ottoman elite or their European counterparts. But these ephemeral works do show that the deposed Sultan had enough skill and knowledge in the rudiments of European music to compose, and that he certainly had a gift for melody. In one of his letters to his sister, Refia Sultan, Murad was to write, Recreation, as you know, is either to play the piano, write music or read history, and this has been the story of how his life and music became the subject of a ballet in his country a century later. <laughs>